Welcome to our Daily Bread Ministries webinars. I'm your host, Tim Jackson, and thanks for joining us today. The webinar we're going to talk about today is Exploring the Land of the Story, Unlocking Biblical Geography. Now, I know many of you probably think that's kind of a dry and dusty topic, but today I have with me our guest, Dr. Jack Beck. Jack, welcome to the scene. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, your background is in theology and Hebrew, and yet you also have this passion for geography. Tell us how that developed. Yeah, well, I, I've always been an outdoor person. I absolutely love the outdoors, hiking, backpacking, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing. Uh, but that part of my life lived separate from my Bible reading for a very, very long time. It wasn't until I was in graduate school and actually took a class in the Bible and geography that those two loves of mine came together and I've never been the same since. And, and now you teach classes in Israel on biblical geography. Yeah, that, that's correct. I, I, I work uh, as an adjunct professor at Jerusalem University College and it's my high privilege to spend, uh, well, about 25% of my year uh, in Israel uh, walking people about the land and helping them build the bridge with Bible. And you've authored, authored the new uh, Discovery House Bible Atlas for us. And we're going to delve into some of that today in our, in our webinar. Let's talk about geography. What's so important about geography, Jack? Well, uh, geography is essential uh, in many respects to who we are, Tim. Um, who we are and how we think and how we most naturally communicate is anchored in where we're from. Okay, give me an example of what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm from southern Wisconsin. And okay. for me, going, quote unquote, up north is going to get away from it all. It's synonymous with recreation and fun and the outdoor life. It's a cardinal compass heading, but it also is synonymous with all that's fun in my life. Yeah, for those of us who live here in Michigan and in southern Michigan, we talk about up north, we'll make a reference to like the UP. And when we make that reference, most people question, what in the world do you mean by the UP? We mean the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So the topography of a lower peninsula, an upper peninsula, shapes the way we, we refer to things around here. It's how we talk to one another, and, and how we talk to one another most naturally. So when we talk about the importance of geography, uh, what about when we read the Bible? This is an atlas on Bible geography. Yeah, we're just on the next page of the same story. Uh, you and I communicate with one another most naturally geographically. And uh, when the folks who wrote the Bible communicated most naturally, they were geographical communicators too. And uh, rather than remove that from the inspiration process, the Lord chose to leave geography in our Bibles. Uh, it means that God speaks geographically. God speaks geographically. I don't know if I've ever heard that statement said before. So the, the information that is in the Bible, those are really clues that we need to kind of unlock and explore to understand better what's going on in Scripture, aren't they? Yeah, if, if, we, if we honor the fact that, that in the Holy Bible we have preserved for us the very thoughts of God, uh, everything that we have there is worthy of our attention and consideration. And there's geography in my Bible. The problem is that we don't pay attention to the details. We tend to think of it as, well, when I can't read it well, or I can't maybe articulate it well, or pronounce it well, I just kind of skip over it. Yeah, and, uh, and I can identify with uh, uh, folks who might be listening in or watching who have had that experience, because that was me for a very, very long okay. time in my life. I, I think you and I tend to, to read past language in the Bible that we don't understand or that's unfamiliar to us. And certainly the geographical references fit that category of things. So give me, give me a little example of what that would look like to uh, be uh, disconnected from something like that in the scriptures. Yeah, well, how about Matthew 4.13? Okay. Uh, Matthew tells us Jesus left Nazareth and went to Capernaum. Uh, it, it's just a few words on the pages of our, of our Bibles, but it, it, uh, it uh, introduces a pretty big change and a big story in Jesus' life. Um, if we don't pay attention to those details, we're going to miss something. So if we don't pay attention to where he was from and where he was going and the impact that had on his ministry, we're going to miss the richness of what the writer is trying to communicate there. Precisely so. If we tend to be disconnected from the geography, sometimes even of our own lives, hmm. and then we come to the scriptures a little disconnected from, especially a geography that is remote to us, how do we begin reconnecting that? 
Yeah, well, I, I think one of, the, one of the realities that many of us face is that we spend less time outdoors. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, even someone like me, who spends a lot of time outdoors, spends less time outdoors than the biblical authors but did. But now, now, what does that have to do with spending time outdoors and the geography thing? Yeah, you know, uh, the Lord created this world to shape us. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's that natural world that in very, very powerful ways repositions our thinking. Uh, John Muir, um, who is one of my favorite uh, writers, 19th century Christian ecologist, uh, made the observation that he would go out in order to get in. Uh, his outdoor experiences were really helping change who he was inside. So something where his location was when he would get into the natural world, somehow it spoke to him. Yeah, it spoke to him. And I think I understand, I think I understand how. When I uh, am captured in my indoor environment. Everything around me has a mortal connection. Uh, the things that are around me were made by human beings. The communication is very, very mortal. So sound. all the technology of today kind of goes against this. Yeah, and, and we, 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 we connect with the ideas and thinking, and we can even come to the conclusion that, that uh, that's all there is. Uh, when I go back outdoors and, and I look at the wonder of God's creation, it, it drives me to think about a different set of things. Uh, the matrix changes for me. I, I look at the, the beauty of God's creation, the artistry of his handiwork. I look at the incredible wisdom that's evident in the in intricacy of his work, and, and I look at the power. Uh, uh, and that resets me in a way that my indoor life doesn't. And so that causes you to have more of a sensitivity the geographical details around you that shape you on the inside. So when you come to the Bible, one of the things I read in your atlas was that the Bible is unique about, uniquely different than other sacred writings of that era. Yeah, if we, if we look at other literature that's roughly contemporary, ancient Near Eastern literature to the Bible, and we look at the religious l uh, literature in that subset, mm -hmm. Um, we begin to see much, much less interest in geography of the earth. There's geography, but it's often of the pagan deities in their cosmic world. So what makes the uniqueness of the geography of the Bible? Well, the geography of the Bible is much more earthbound and earth-focused. And I think that there's an important reason for that. God tied his plan to save the world, which is a core message within Scripture for us. He tied that message to a family that lived in a specific place. Uh, when he came to Abraham and said to him, your family will become a nation, he also said, your family that becomes a nation will have this land to live in. And from that family on that land, the one person who can fix the brokenness will arrive. Now, when you say that, what, what comes to my mind is that geography or the story of, re of redemption has a geography to it. It does. It most certainly does, from one end of the Bible to the other. So if we're looking at the uniqueness of the Bible, one of the things that as I read your atlas and explored that in preparation for all this, you have a unique twist in your, your atlas too, because you talk about two different kinds of geography, one that I'm familiar with and one that was a brand new term to me. You talk about historical geography. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about literary geography. Explain what each of those are and the differences between them, would you? Yeah, historical geography is the way in which geography and Bible has been connected for a very, very, very long time. Uh, it asks the question, how does place impact event? And because the Bible is so rich in events, it's a very, very natural way of looking at the relationship between Bible and Scripture. Historical geography, how do how does place impact event? Um, but I meet those events, as well as a lot of other thinking of God in Scripture in literary form. Hmm. Uh, I meet stories, I meet poetry, I meet letters, I meet proverbs. Uh, and in each of those cases, geography becomes part of the communication process. Literary geography asks the question, how do the biblical authors and poets use geography in order to shape me as their reader? I know I've heard you use a term about your trips. Uh, you spend time in Israel, about 25% of your time, correct? Yeah, that's correct. And, and, and you teach classes over there, but you teach them in the field. And you talked about teaching via landscape. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is the way in which people of Bible times learned their Bibles. Uh, before there was uh, the Bible in writing, available like it is today for us, uh, folks who were living in the Bible lands uh, learned their Bible stories, they learned the poetry of the Bible 
by looking into landscape. When they walked a ridge line yeah, on their way to Jerusalem for one of the three high festivals, uh, they would be looking out at valleys and ridges that held Bible history. So they would see more than topography. They would see Bible events. And Deuteronomy 6.6.7 6, says, this is a teaching moment. Uh, the scripture says, teach these things to your children. Here it is, as you walk along the road. Geography becomes a teacher of theology. And those become memory markers. You know, you walk past that landmark and it gives you the opportunity to retell the story of what God did here. Yeah. And, and, but sometimes they probably also erected, I remember when they crossed from the Jordan, over the Jordan River into the land, they erected a monument with stones to commemorate the event. Yeah, certainly the landscape carried the memory of many of these events, but the ones that were particularly important to the history of God's people of the past were often marked in some way by a, a well, by the erection of a memorial altar, a tomb, uh, and these become mm. natural stopping points for people, uh, just like the road signs, historical markers are, uh, as uh, we travel about and uh, see them along our highway system. Now, if, you know, let me beg the question here. If I don't pay attention to the geography of the Bible, is it really that big a deal? Yeah, that's kind of a dangerous question <laughs> to ask a guy who spent 18 years <laughs> around this topic, isn't it? Um, and and uh, you've softened the question because uh, you might even ask, isn't this trivia? Yeah. Here's the reality. Trivi yeah. Trivial information. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the trivia is gone from the communication event. And when the biblical authors uh, come to share a story with us, when they move the event into story form, when they move the thoughts of God into poetry, uh, the extra stuff, the stuff that doesn't count, the trivia, that's get that all gets left behind. We get the essentials, and it's the essentials that I'm inviting us to pay closer attention okay, to. Okay, so the, the trivia has been distilled out already, so that when the authors of the Scripture, inspired by God Himself, say, these are places and events that you need to pay attention to, and here are the geographical markers, those are markers that we dare not ignore. Yeah, we, we can ignore them, but we can't, we're going we're gonna to ignore them and pay the price. And what's the price? Well, the, the price is to, to the degree that those elements of the communication, now whether it's in the poetry or the Proverbs or the letter or the story, those are part of the communication of the event. And if we remove them, we miss a part of the communication. Now, you know, something I want to talk about is <clears throat> as we treat geography as not trivia, but essential information, what Give me an example of something where we would ignore what we assume is trivial and make it and look at something that is more essential. Yeah. Well, can I go back to Matthew 4.13? Sure. Because I think that's a very powerful, it, it was one of the first passages that uh, kind of opened this door for me to see how essential little things are in the text, geogra little geographical things are in the text. Matthew 4.13 says, Jesus left Nazareth and moved to Capernaum. And on the pages of my Bible, those two place names look a lot alike. Mm -hmm. uh, if I go to the back of my Bible and I look at my Bible map, they look very much alike. But when I begin to look more carefully at the character of those two places, you can't imagine two places more different. Nazareth was small and inward looking. Capernaum was a large outward looking place. And Jesus' move from Nazareth to Capernaum signaled a, different, a very different environment in which he was living. Well, and you're also talking about uh, a different population. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In Nazareth, you, you have a very inward-looking, observant Jewish community that's been formed who's actually using the geography in order to create some isolation for themselves from the Greco-Roman world. Uh, Capernaum is also using its geography, but it's using it not to isolate but to connect to the larger world. It is a town of Jews and Gentiles, a, uh, a, a, a community, a town of international travelers as the, uh, as the caravanners move through. Um, it was a happening place compared to Nazareth. So, in one sense, not disrespectfully, Jesus was kind of a hick from the sticks up in Nazareth who moves just 30 miles, but moves to what would be considered more of a metropolitan area next to an international highway so that when he began his ministry, it would spread throughout all the area. Yeah, it, it's hard to imagine that Jesus did most of what we know in an area that's two miles by two miles by three miles. Uh, but when you take those events and you locate them correctly, you create the opportunity for news of what he said and did to spread like wildfire well before Pentecost. Well, when we think of then of not skipping over the details, mm -hmm. 
and we want to start paying attention to them. You said there's three things we need to do. You said we need to notice, to learn, and to ask. What is it that we need to notice, Jack? Well, uh, you know, when, when, when we read Scripture, we tend to ignore the things that we don't understand or that are unfamiliar uh, to us. Uh, so it takes a bit of discipline to change that habit. Uh, it's, it's coming to understand what geography is. The geography is more than just maps, that it's more than just place names, uh, that it's actually the topography, it's the geology, it's the climate, it's the rainfall cycles. Um, all of those things are part of the, of the features of the earth and the forces that, that impact them. If I actively uh, make a point of looking for those, I'm going to find them on virtually every page of my Bible. Every, First step. every page? I'm saying for every page. Uh, it's very hard for me to find a page uh, on my, in my Bible, it doesn't contain at least one reference in one open page to, uh, to geography and include it in the communication. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to notice what's there. What, what do we need to learn then? Yeah, when we, when we start noticing things, we're going we're gonna to realize we don't know enough about that to make the next step, which is understanding how it plays out in, uh, in a literary way. Uh, so uh, there's the opportunity to use uh, atlases, encyclopedias, um, other resource tools, including trips to Israel, by the way, in order to, to flesh that out, in order to better understand that particular geographical reference. And once we've got that in hand, once we've noticed it, once we better understand it, we are well positioned to integrate it into our reading of the text, to ask the question, why would the biblical author include that detail when so many others are left out? How am I being shaped as a user, as a reader, by that particular data? So asking the question then, why is this here in this passage? Why did the author bother to to pick up on this little detail and kind of underscore it, highlight it in pink, and, and make it kind of glow to us, uh, that we should be paying attention to that. Yeah, it is, uh, it, it, remember, if, if, we, if we operate with the assumption that the trivia is gone, if the extras are left out, then the essentials are left for us to weigh and to consider. Uh, and uh, I do myself a disservice as a Bible reader, as a Bible interpreter, um, if I don't engage uh, those geographical features. So when, when you take somebody on one of your field expedition teaching trips, They'll like the, way, the fact that you've called it an expedition, expedition because many of my students feel like this is far from a walk. It's an expedition or a trek in their mind. Because you, you trek how, how far in? Well, in, in 11 days, we'll hike between 85 and 100 miles. And so it, you're covering some ground. It becomes a matter of some pride for these folks that they've <laughs> covered that much ground. That, that they've covered more or less than the next group that's coming, yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, but when you talk about that, it, you know, I know when I'm hunting. Mm-hmm. I, I get a, a mental map. I can tell you exactly locations and where I'm going to be and give a reference point to my brothers or other family members that I'm hunting with that, hey, I'm going to be hunting off the knob, you're off this point, yeah. and all that because of the lay of the land. Yeah. Is yeah. that the same thing that, that the people would do in ancient times? A absolutely. Uh, and uh, the idea of the mental map is, is one that we all have. I mean, all of us uh, make many trips, many, many trips a day using that mental map, whether it's to the store or to work or to school. Um, we're not hauling out the GPS. We're not uh, uh, using a map to get, to get us there. And what we have to realize is that for the folks who wrote the Bible, and the first folks who read the Bible, uh, they knew where Bethlehem was. They knew where the Dead Sea was. They knew where Jericho was. Uh, and uh, that mental map that they carried is one that we can begin building for ourselves as Bible readers as well. And just remember their mode of transportation, too. Yeah, they, they were walking. They slowly walked by everything. Maybe they rode a donkey. Yeah. But most of them walked on foot past all these places. It was a slow process. Yeah. And, uh, and, and realize that even though I talk about walking seven or eight miles during the day with my, with my students in Israel, the average travel distance in Bible times during a day's travel is about 18 to 23 miles. 18 to 23 miles. 18 to 23 miles. And a lot of it's uphill, isn't it? Especially well, in the Judean hill country. It seems like it all goes uphill. <laughs> uh, so talk to me then about, you know, if we develop this mental map, I know when I come to the land of Israel, mm -hmm. I look at the map and I orient myself by the bodies of water. Yeah. The, the, the Sea of Galilee in the north, the ribbon of blue that goes to the south, and then the Dead Sea. Uh, there's a kind of a quick reference. But you talk about that once you have the mental map, then you need to talk about 
distinctive connotations. What do you mean by distinctive connotations? Yeah, uh, again, something we do all the time, but we don't carry it over into our Bible reading. Hmm. And when we think about a place, um, it's, it's not just a, a dot on the landscape or a position on a map. Um, a place has the ability to recall events for us, to, to solicit emotions from us. A Give me an example. Well, let me just add, a connotation is, is, what we, is what we think about when we're in a place, it's how we feel when we're there. So let's take an example, how about Gettysburg? It was a powerful moment for me as a 13-year-old boy to walk that battlefield in Gettysburg. It was very different from having studied that in my classes to suddenly be in that place and have the place draw in the memories and the feelings that were Im intimately linked to place. Gettysburg communicates a connotation. So, so Gettysburg, that place which was a pivotal battle in the American Civil War in Pennsylvania, that when you think of that, your mind goes to certain events and things. Yeah. So yeah. if I were to say to you, Normandy. Yeah, absolutely. Or ha how about the, the, uh, the wall? that existed between East and West Germany, uh, the Berlin Wall. Uh, these places have a power in and of themselves that, uh, that we dare not miss. And it's a very powerful tool in the hand of a writer because if writers are the tools with which I get to manipulate your feelings and thinkings, uh, thinking, and I can use a place name in service to that, uh, I'm gonna do it. Okay. Now you just used a, a real strong word that for me as a counselor many times I hear, if I use to manipulate, you're talking about writers manipulating their audience. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, say more of what you mean by that because I know you're big into the literature of this. Yeah, uh, I'm a writer, okay? Uh, and so when I, when I sit at my desk at home writing and imagining my audience, I'm thinking how can I change you? How, how can I change who you are through the language choices that, that I make? And if geography happens to be one of, the, one of the tools in my arsenal, you can be sure that I'm gonna put it to work. So when we think of a place like, uh, wow, uh, the Grand Canyon. Yeah. That can engender some feelings, especially if you traveled there as a kid. If it's your vacation spot, I mean, th there's all sorts of feelings that rush up that are different about that maybe in the office you work in. That has a whole different feel or connotation to it, which is different than your grandma and grandpa's house that you visited. Sure. That has a connotation of feeling and memories associated with it. Uh, places are not just cold, sullen dots on a map. They live and breathe emotion and, and thought. So it's not just geography, it's also what took place there. But you also talk about forgotten connections. Yeah, yeah, the, the connectedness that, that exists helps develop. I mean, connotations can be developed in a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. The very nature of a place carries certain connotations. The Everglades have a certain perspective that's carried geographically to our minds when we hear, hear, the, hear the label. But history can change the way we think about a place too. Uh, for those of us of a certain age, and I won't say what that age is, <laughs> but Dealey Plaza, where JFK was assassinated, yeah. uh, is a place that carries a memory and a feeling. Uh, more recently, the World Trade Center footprint is a place that carries memories and feelings that are different than grandma's house. Uh, and it's what happened there before that can uh, also influence connotation. So when you're talking about building that mental map of our lives or a mental map of a new place, especially the scriptures, for many of us, a place that we've never visited, yeah. you're talking about a whole different level of connectedness, connotations, and understanding that begin to enhance our ability to read what have become very familiar stories in many ways. Yeah, stories can go flat on us by familiarity, uh, and poetry can lose its zip mm. for us. Uh, but if we begin to see the geography, it's often the geography and the connotations associated with the geography in a text that allow it to percolate up off the page to move from black and white into high definition color and that allows us to, to gain insights and connections we may not have seen there before. So let me ask you this, on the students that you take with you on the trek, yeah. the Beck trek yeah. as they've labeled it at times, what are the changes you see in them as you lift this material off the pages of a Bible atlas and you place their feet on that ground. What are the changes you see? Well, the most frequent comment that I hear from folks is, I didn't realize there was so much geography in my Bible, mm. <laughs> uh, which is what happens when you begin to notice it. Uh, the second comment I hear an awful lot is, I, I just will never read my Bible the same way again. I, I can't go back. 
uh, once you have tasted the depth and the insight that you can find in engaging the geography of the text, it's uh, very difficult to retreat and to stop seeing what you're now seeing in those texts. And it enhances your ability to understand the story and to be able to retell that story for others with a whole lot more vivid detail, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And we're going to use a couple of examples in just a little while here that I hope will show that even the most familiar Bible stories, the ones that we think we know so well, and maybe stories that have geography we haven't considered. Okay, l let's jump to that right now. All let's right. jump into one of those. Uh, if I think of an Old Testament story, we're going to do one of the Old Testament, one okay. of the New. I think of the Old Testament story as is, is the one that just about everybody knows, whether they're a Christian who came up through Sunday yeah. school or not. It's the David and Goliath story. Yeah, and uh, if you ask folks for, to, from memory, start telling that story, uh, they'll usually start by describing Goliath. And what they've done is they've skipped the first three verses of 1 Samuel 17, which contain the geographical introduction to the story. Okay, so let, let's take a look at that story. Let's kind of unpack that for folks. Mm -hmm. the, the David and Goliath story that takes place in the Ela Valley. That's correct. Let's look at a picture of the Ela Valley here. Describe for the folks uh, what they're seeing and who's where, where are the armies of Israel, where are the armies of the Philistines, and, and where are they all situated in this scene? Yeah, the, the biblical author of 1 Samuel 17 very intentionally begins with several place names. Uh, and as we uh, look at this picture, we're standing on one of them. We can't see it, it's under our feet. Uh, that is the location of Azeka. Uh, the Ela Valley is the long uh, ribbon of valley that first, is, first of all crosses left to right in front of us and then circles back between the, the two ridges in the uh, foreground and continues all the way to the east uh, to the Judean mountains that are the most distant thing that I can see in the, in the photograph. Uh, when we look at the way the biblical author sets up the players on the, on, the, on the board here, we see that this area in front of us is full of Philistines. That's an unexpected place to find Philistines. Actually, it's a troubling spot to find Philistines because behind us in this for, uh, image is where we have the coastal plain leading out to the Mediterranean Sea. That's the Philistine homeland uh, at our back. So to see Philistines drifting all the way through this valley system, almost to the mountains in the background where the Israelites have a home, creates a problem. And, and so we see this valley that kind of snakes, does an S turn around that little knoll in the center there. And, and heads up as we're looking east towards, that's the Judean mountains there on the horizon, correct? That is correct. So as we look at that, that little section back there in the center that looks like some agricultural flatland back there, up against those hills, that's where the Israeli army was encamped. Yeah, that, you have it exactly correct. The biblical author tells us that the Philistines were encamped in the Ela Valley between Azekah and Soko, and that takes them all the way through that left turn in the valley to the bottom of the, of the ridge, and uh, all that's left uh, for the Israelite army is the tiny corner, that tiny brown corner back up against the mountain. So, so at this point, it's fair to say that Saul and his army, they have their backs to the wall here. Absolutely. Because if Absolutely. the Philistines break through here, they have complete run of the land. If we can take a look at a map, I'll yeah. show you what that looks like. Uh, we know from a, an earlier story, and that's illustrated in the green line on this map, we have a sense of what the Philistines were up to. Uh, this is when Saul wasn't paying attention like he needed to be. Uh, and um, what, the, what the Philistines had done is they had penetrated very, very deeply into the central mountains. You see that they're all the way into Michmash. And, and this is where Saul's son Jonathan takes the lead in a very courageous attack and is able to lead the soldiers and drive the Philistines back down that green line. Now coming to this story, uh, take a look at the orange line. Uh, that orange line that goes from Gath to Soko uh, is the direction that the Philistines are, are, uh, are coming. The purple line is the route that David would have taken from Bethlehem down into the, to the battlefront uh, where the Ela Valley is. Uh, what the Philistines are doing is they're doing exactly what the green line suggests they had done earlier. They're going to try to break through the Israelite army line and penetrate all the way into the interior to the ridge route and to Bethlehem. So David's coming down from Bethlehem. Basically, he's, he's a supply boy at this time. He's a supply boy. Taking, taking food and, and things down to his brothers who are with Saul and the army that are parked 
up in that little little section of the Elah Ela Valley, which is all that's left of it because the Philistines fill the rest of it. And think of how that would have impacted the people who are living in the hill country of Judah above, because that's how this geography is supposed to strike us mm -hmm. as Bible readers. 1 Samuel 17 starts off by establishing this geography because it articulates the national crisis, a national crisis of supreme proportions. This very, very rich agricultural valley has been lost to invading Philistines. And the Philistines have positioned themselves at just the right point to make the invasion uh, by the Husan Ridge into the, into the interior. And once they have gotten to the interior, to the ridge route, they have the run of the place north and south. And every village along that ridge route, and there are a lot of them, are going to be at risk. So all those places that are connected from, as you see on the map there, from Hevron clear up to Shiloh, all those little towns along there are at risk if Saul and the army don't stop the Philistines here. Yeah, and, and that's the whole point. Before we ever hear about the Goliath uh, character and his, his uh, armor, we are uh, being told about how serious a matter this is. If, if there was a time for a leader to step forward and demonstrate that that, that person could uh, handle uh, a national security crisis of such extreme importance, this geography suggests the time has come. In Saul, the chosen one of the people, they wanted a king who would fight for them, we're told earlier, yeah. didn't fight for them. He doesn't even come close to matching the job description. Uh, he inspires no courage. In fact, we're told that he and his soldiers fear. No one has a better idea, and no one has a, dir a direction to follow in taking on the challenge of Goliath. And it's only when David comes into the arena that that begins to change. And you see this massive change even with the, the Israeli army that once David defeats Goliath, they too gain some courage and pursue the Philistines. And it's a very different picture at the end of that chapter is when it got started, isn't it? It is. It's a terribly different picture than what we had begun with. And it's told with geography. Because as the geography begins that story and establishes a, a, an Ela Valley that's full of menacing Philistines, the end of the story, verses 52 and 53, close with the same geography, but in exactly the reverse fashion. Now this valley that, would, that had been so full of threatening soldiers was empty but of, of all those but those who had died. So that's a pretty dramatic situation that changes from the little valley I had pictured that David and Goliath had a skirmish yeah. to a major epic battle uh, that really impacted the history of the nation of Israel and established a new leader. The difference is the geography. It's not incidental, but integral to the telling of the story. So, so let's take a look at one in the New Testament. Yeah. If I think of a, of a popular story uh, or a location, Bethlehem. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about Bethlehem. Well, uh, Bethlehem is a place that's so well known because of the birth of Jesus. Huh? Uh, but there's more to Bethlehem than that. Uh, Bethlehem is a place that's very, very rich in positive connotations. And that starts with a better understanding of the agriculture around Bethlehem. If we look at a picture there, we see uh, a picture of the, the, the trees. And this is, this is some fertile soil where much grows there, isn't there? Yeah, and it's, it's not just the fertility of the soil, Tim. It's the topography. It's the lay of the land. Uh, Judah's hill country, uh, characteristically, is composed of, of steeply sided, narrow V-shaped valleys. And when you have an architecture like that in the geography, there's very little farming that you can do at the bottom of that valley. In fact, the only option you have is to construct, to build your own fa farmland by uh, building terraces up the, up the steep slopes. It's a labor-intensive job to just get a farm field in place. What's different about Bethlehem is that the topography changes. It opens up and you have natural farm fields just waiting for you to plant grain, not to build terraces. And that gave us the name of Bethlehem, didn't it? Yeah, it's, it's wheat growing country par excellence. And the, the, the place name, Bethlehem, is reflective of the Hebrew Beit Lechem, house of bread, a bakery place. So a place where they could find hope because there's a lot of food that they would gain from this area. Yeah, it provided a solution to the topographical problem of Judah's hill country, which created the, the, the difficulty in, in farming. But there's more to it. 
Well, because I always think of Bethlehem, and I think most of us do, as we look uh, at a map, we, we can see that Bethlehem is obviously on that red line where Mary and Joseph make the trek from Nazareth yeah. down to Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus. We think of Bethlehem as the birthplace of Jesus, probably more than anything else. Yeah, but if we're really going to understand Bethlehem, Tim, we need to take a step back into the Old Testament because how people thought about Bethlehem, how they felt about it, the connotations associated with Bethlehem stretch back, first of all, to the time of Ruth and Naomi. Hmm. Explain a little bit more about that. Well, uh, Ruth and Naomi had been in Moab. Uh, they unfortunately lost their husbands and now were coming hmm. to Bethlehem. Uh, a family at real high risk because they had lost the connections to the extended family that, uh, had, uh, that, that had been in place when their husbands were living. Uh, they were a pretty hopeless pair when they arrived in Bethlehem, but this family in crisis found Bethlehem to be a solution spot. A kindly man by the name of Boaz, who in no way needed to add more hungry mouths to his household, uh, married Ruth, brought Naomi and Ruth into his household, and so at the level of family, uh, this provided a solution. Okay, so at this key moment, this one woman, Ruth, a Moabitess, she wasn't yeah. even an Israelite, yeah. a Moabitess who gets added into the line and lineage of David, which is the next story about Bethlehem, isn't it? Yeah, it, it sure is, because this, this village that had provided a solution for the family uh, needed to provide a solution for a nation in crisis. Uh, that crisis was precipitated again by Saul's failure to be the leader God had wanted him to, to be. Uh, and when Saul failed, the Lord went on the lookout for a man after his own heart. He sent Samuel to the village of Bethlehem, and it's in Bethlehem that Samuel found David. Uh, the village that had provided a solution for the family of Naomi and Ruth in crisis now provided a solution for the nation in crisis at the time of Saul. And that ties back into our Old Testament story of the David and Goliath. He had already been chosen, and he became the solution to become the leader of the nation and that was proven in the day of David yeah. and Goliath incident. If we're following that trajectory, if we're following that arrow, we'll be less surprised by the language of Micah 5.2. Okay, explain more about that. Yeah, this is Micah uh, giving us uh, one of the most interesting details that we have in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. He says, but you Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, yet out of you will come that one who will be from of old, from everlasting. Micah says, when you look for the Messiah, look for him in Bethlehem. And to use the word Bethlehem, uh, you know, I would expect that, oh, he'd make mention of the place, that, that Matthew and Luke would make mention that, okay, there's a place, Bethlehem, and that's just where they're headed because Joseph was of the house and lineage of David. Yeah, and here's where literary geography comes okay. in. Okay. Let's take a look at this. Because if Matthew and Luke were only interested, only interested in making sure I made the connection between Micah's prophecy and the fulfillment in the birth of Jesus, all they had had to do is mention Bethlehem once. Luke mentions it four times. Matthew five times. Nine times. Between those two Gospels, we have nine mentions of this village. Why so much? Why so much is the question, isn't yeah. it? That's the literary That's what geography. You notice. That's the literary geography question, you see? It's not just communicating information, it's using the name of the village and its connotations to create a feeling, a sense of ownership in, uh, in, in this birth of the child. You, you put the manger in the middle of the picture and you surround it with the label Bethlehem, all the good feelings, all the solution-oriented thinking that you've come to, th to, to associate with Bethlehem now encircles the manger. I think it's a literary tool. So when I think of that uh, Christmas time, Christmas card photograph that has a manger with this glow around it, you're saying that there was really the intention of the biblical writers to paint that glow to say what makes this town so important is that it had been prepared for years to welcome Messiah that was going to be a solution for the world. Yeah, and, and, and follow that arrow all the way through, and it creates this very, very beautiful matrix. It provides a solution for a family at the time of Ruth and Naomi, for a nation at the time of Saul, and for the world when the Christ mm -hmm. child was born there. So, right now, you know, this has been a, a great. I've enjoyed this so much. We have some questions. Connie asked this question. I am interested in geography, but I do not have access to good maps. What would be a way that I can get into geography more? 
Yeah, uh, maps are a great starting point. Uh, and um, it's one of the reasons when we did the Discovery House Bible Atlas, I feel like I'm running a commercial here, but... Uh, That's I, okay, we'll let you do that a little bit. <laughs> as long as I'm in-house here, right? Uh, the, the, one of the signature items in this atlas was the creation of an entirely new map set. Uh, I'm not sure that everyone will realize just how important that is. Uh, the map making science of, our, of cartography migrates. It gets better and better and better. And uh, we were able to take advantage of some of those uh, uh, advances in cartography. And um, I worked uh, to, uh, with uh, 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 folks out on the East Coast in order to, to create uh, the maps that we have here. So uh, I, I think we have some of the best current maps available in this atlas. Okay, maps will be a good starting place. Yeah. But, but what else? If she says she doesn't have access to really good maps, uh, what about Google? and things like that. Is that helpful at all? Uh, it can be, uh, but like so many other uh, things, Google um, uh, can have information that's helpful and, and not so helpful aboard. So it, it, it can be a resource for you, but, but I think I'd, I'd prefer to direct folks uh, towards uh, uh, publications uh, or websites that folks have put up, uh, who, uh, folks who have some credentials in the area. And a map kind of gives them the opportunity to have a lay of the land. Yeah, yeah. Maps, uh, maps help help us visualize. Remember, they don't take you the whole way. And 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 I want to make sure that I that I that I say that uh, again. Uh, maps are great, but there's more to the communication process than just maps. It's determining what those connotations are, figuring out what happened in a place before. Uh, those are the sorts of things that can really fill out the literary geography we're talking about. Well, and when you say that, I know one of the comments I've heard from others that have read your particular atlas mm -hmm. was it reads more like a commentary. Yeah, and I appreciate hearing that because uh, it should sound different. Uh, most Bible atlases have been built on the foundation of historical geography, and so they'll be very event-oriented in explaining the, the nature of the event itself. A literary geography, which I'm adding to the process here, okay. uh, is engaging the communication. Uh, and so I'm trying to understand how geography has been co-opted by the biblical authors as they shape their message. It should sound more like a commentary because it's, it's handling the text more like a commentary would. Okay. Carol asked this question. She said uh, she would like you to explain uh, when she reads in the Bible, it talks about it being the land of milk and honey. What? I mean, some of the pictures we look at in here, yeah. it looks like a pretty rocky and austere place. Yeah, yeah, it sure does. And uh, I appreciate the question because it's the question a lot of people ask when they get off the airplane <laughs> in Israel. <laughs> they go, where's, yeah. the, where's the land of milk and honey? Because it is a more austere looking piece of real estate. Um, realize that when we communicate uh, geographically, we're always contextualizing that. And when the Israelites heard that, they weren't in the context of Israel, they were in the context of wilderness. In fact, they had been in wilderness for 40, for 40 years. years. And uh, they knew nothing except the, the dry, uh, almost green-free landscape of the Sinai, the Paran, and uh, uh, Zin wildernesses. So anything that uh, was good uh, for growing flowers, for gl growing wheat, for pasturing animals was going to be a very desirable land. So that's the whole idea that it's, it's somehow it's a productive land. It's a description of a productive land that was going to produce something that would sustain them. And it, and it also contrasts, in my mind, the primary products of north and south. Uh, if you run a line east-west through Jerusalem, north of that line, generally there's enough annual precipitation for wheat and for flowers to grow. Uh, bee honey is going to be harvested in that northern area. That is the land of honey. Uh, milk is most likely goat's milk. That was the, the, the uh, commodity that was, uh, that uh, milk commodity that was consumed. And south of that east-west line from Jerusalem, when the agriculture becomes more difficult, we shift to more of a pastoral economy uh, and the goat's milk. So the land of milk, the south, the land of honey to the north is a way of speaking about the land in its entirety through its primary commodities. Oh, that's a reference I've never really heard before, but the, the commodities were used to give the the northern and the southern border of all that. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, and we'll just add briefly that if you read that text carefully in Deuteronomy, the Lord hinges that promise on a condition. He says, if you obey me, then this will be a land that flows 
with milk and honey. And as we, as we watch the ecosystem go up and down in the Bible, it's going up and down often in rhythm to the obedience of God's people. Okay. Uh, Carrie asked this question. She feels overwhelmed anytime she takes a look at this kind of material and hears about all the details. Any recommendations on where to start with this topic of geography? Yeah, start small. Start small. Uh, start with the familiar stories. Um, again, I, I believe this atlas allows you to, to, to put, your feet, uh, put your feet in the water with this without jumping all the, all the way in. You can see whether or not this, this makes sense to you. I find that often when the idea begins to make sense, people feel liberated from the text and begin to see things on their own. Well, one of the things we're going to do that we're offering to folks participating in this webinar, they're going to be able to download a free PDF of the introduction, and the first chapter of the atlas. So we're going to get their feet, their toes in the water and get their feet wet a little bit to see yeah. how they are able to take this in and begin processing that. Yeah, and, and like uh, the learning of anything, you, you start with big picture before you move to small picture. And in the atlas, uh, in the second chapter, I try to do exactly that. I start with the largest pictures, with the, 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 the land painted with the broadest brush strokes, uh, and then we eventually move down into tinier and tinier strokes to understand the, the nuances of the land. Okay, John wants to ask this. He says, please share your personal reflections on what it means to walk the same terrain that Jesus walked. Yeah, it, it, is, it is an amazing experience. Um, it, uh, it allows me to do uh, so much of what Jesus did, to feel the elevation changes in my thighs as they burn when I'm going uphill, to feel the wind and the wind direction change. And remember that wind direction can have an impact on, 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 on the weather and expectation. Jesus talked about that in his, uh, in his ministry. Uh, the scenes that unravel before our eyes, or unfold rather, before our eyes, become the very imagery that Jesus picks up as he as this itinerant teacher and moves through the landscape and talks about fishing and talks about agriculture and talks about rainfall. Uh, it, is, it is a sense around experience that you get. So as he's walking through the land, because that was his primary means of transportation, yeah. he's pulling from what he's seeing around to use those as tangible, geographical, topographical, climactic illustrations to illustrate the truth that he's teaching. Yeah, and I want you to realize that's how he learned the Bible. Uh, Jesus' uh, primary way of learning the Bible would have been the way people learned their Bible in the New Testament era. It was from their parents while they were walking the land. He learned by landscape. He in turn taught by landscape. It's a wonderful symmetry. I think particularly of the Psalms where it talks about there are certain Psalms of ascent. Mm -hmm. Psalms that talk about going up to worship. And that's that Judean hill country you talked about, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, P, the, 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 the challenge of going uphill, the challenge of travel uh, to Jerusalem becomes an opportunity for reflection on my own mortal limitations and what's waiting for me at the end of the journey. And uh, uh, getting out and walking those same places, uh, it, uh, it causes the same thoughts to erupt. Yeah. Stephanie asked this question. It's kind of a unique question on Twitter. She says this, are we actually changing the meaning of the story by leaving out the geography? Uh, yeah, I think it's important for everyone to know and realize that the essential message of the Bible is not lost that the key words of, of forgiveness and hope and love can be found in the Bible. I know it's found by many people in the Bible, even who aren't weighing in the geographical com components. What I'm suggesting is that there are enhancements to our understanding of that message, clarity that comes uh, when we include geography in the process. We're missing something if we don't. See, I was asked the question when I finished seminary because I knew Greek and Hebrew, yeah. how did I read the Bible differently by one of my friends? Yeah. And my response to her was, it, it, we both have the same Bible, we both have the same story, all the same content is there, yeah. is that, well, maybe you're watching it in standard definition, black and white, and I get to watch it in high def color. Yeah, yeah. That's a great analogy that could be applied here as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Janine asked this question. When I see pictures today of Bethlehem, it's mostly olive trees and fields. Is it still a breadbasket today? 
Uh, actually, the <laughs> Bethlehem, uh, the valleys that were so rich in grain agriculture, have increasingly filled with homes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, really counter to the way it would have been in Bible times. In Bible times, people built their homes on the infertile hillsides and farmed the valleys. Uh, and uh, today, we see more and more of those valleys consumed with homes. But there are still wonderful agricultural fields there around Bethlehem. Okay. Uh, let's see. Sarah asked this a question. What is your opinion on Golgotha as a place of the crucifixion? Yeah, when the, when the gospel writers report on where this amazing event occurred, and, and that deserves another sentence, doesn't okay. it? There's no place on earth that has a bigger impact on my eternal destiny than that place. It would be a place I'd want to visit yeah. and think about and, and reflect on. Um, I, I think what may be behind the question is that there are actually two locations in Jerusalem that, um, uh, and compete is too strong a word, that have a claim on being that place of the, of the uh, place of crucifixion and place of resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, the garden tomb, Gordon's Calvary uh, to the north, and the Church of Holy Sepulchre, which is a little bit south of that uh, location. And while I can't be absolutely certain and close the door on either one, I think the great weight of evidence uh, goes to the area of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. uh, has modern civilization made changes in the geography of the land? Yeah, uh, it, it's one of the things that challenges me as a teacher okay. in the land. Uh, my goal as a field education instructor uh, for Bible students in Israel is to help them see the land as the people of the Bible saw it. Uh, and what happens is as urban, as urban sprawl spreads out from the coast uh, inland, uh, some of the views that uh, I had counted on using uh, are no longer uh, available. So uh, it's definitely an, an issue. Uh, not, well, I'm, I'm thankful that there are quite a number of national parks in Israel where the landscape and views are preserved. And uh, increasingly, I take advantage of those. Okay. Harold asked this question. I think we can squeeze this in yet. He says, can you explain the word N, E-N, that goes before a lot of the city names in Israel. Yeah, ab absolutely, and Karim, uh, and so on. Uh, and N is a spring. It's one, of the, it's one of several types of water sources that were available uh, to people in the ancient world. It was the most desirable of all the water resources because it required the least amount of, of development and had the most naturally fresh and filtered water. Uh, so when someone found that desirable water source, they might give it the label Ain, and then some uh, additional identifier. Ain Kerem, the, the spring of near the vineyard. The Kerem is a, is a vineyard. Okay. So identifying the water source is a pretty important thing in a land that very, very much is dependent on rainfall. Yeah, this, this, this is one of the most significant differences between uh, us who live in the modern Western world and uh, those who lived in the biblical world. Um, we we, we uh, have to reduce our fresh, per capita fresh water potential to about 3% of what we think of in order to arrive at the conditions of people in Bible times Israel. 3%? 3%. Wow. Well, let me ask you this, last, see if we can squeeze this last one in. What was the geographic region like for Ephraim and Manasseh back in that day? Uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, different geologically uh, and different topographically uh, and different hydrologically. So we could spend some time talking about that. And I don't think we have that much time. Yeah. <laughs> Let me say this. Uh, the name Ephraim, twice fruitful, is what the Hebrew Ephraim means, uh, is the place where you have the best composition of topography to give you security, the best geology to give you the agricultural uh, quality of the soils and the best rainfall. Mm. It is truly an Ephraim, a twice blessed, twice fruitful place. Well, thanks Jack for taking the time to be with us and explaining a lot. And for those of you who are joining us, I sure hope you will take advantage of the materials we have available for you. Uh, you can go to ourdailybread.org backslash topics, places of the Bible, and there you will find all the information we have available for you. Seven days from now, you'll get the video of this actual webinar that you can watch it whatever time is good for you. You also get the audio that you can listen to as well as download the PowerPoint. Don't forget, you can also get access to a PDF of the introduction and the first full chapter of Jack's Atlas. And then finally, 
Uh, you'll also find a link there if you wish to purchase Jack's Atlas. We would encourage you to take a look at that. Discovery House Bible Atlas. And I hope this has been helpful to you. You know, we tend to think of the land of Israel as a far off distant place, but there's geography that impacts all of it. And our familiarity with the land can help us better appreciate and enjoy what in the world was God doing in that tiny little space on the eastern side of the Mediterranean that has basically changed the course of human history. It has changed the world and God in his scriptures, he embeds those geographical clues for us to discover. So I hope during this time that you've been able to, along with us, develop maybe a, a new lens to look at the scriptures. I hope you read the scriptures differently than what you have before, that you'll pick up on some of those clues. Uh, turn to the maps in the back of your Bible, and if you want something more to delve into, you can take a look at Jack's Atlas, because I think it really is a different approach that you will appreciate, that whole literary geography component that I found very interesting myself. And always, obviously, one of our goals is not just to help you understand your Bible better, but help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, the God of the details. And that's the thing that impressed me in talking with Jack. The geographical details in Scripture reflect the, the God of the details who pays so much attention, not only to his physical world embedding those clues, but he pays so much attention to us individually that he sent his son in that place of Bethlehem to become the Savior of the world. So, for all of us here at Our Daily Bread Ministries, I'm your host, Tim Jackson. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.